All right, this is an interview with Misako Shigekawa on September 19th in Santa Ana, California by Heather Koga. Also present at this interview are Wayne Koga, the cameraman, and Marlene Shigekawa, um, Misako's daughter. For the record, do I have your permission to audio and videotape your interview? Yes, okay. Please state your name and its spelling. Oh, it's Misako Shigekawa. M-I-S-A-K-O-S-H-I-G-E-K-A-W-A. -E when were you born? Uh, 1, 2, oh, 9. And where were you born? In Los Angeles. Okay. From what country did your family originally immigrate to the United States? From Japan. And who were the first members of your family to come to the California area? They, they were the first. Well, they first were in the San Francisco area, and then, and then they came down to... In fact, they lived in La Habra at the time I was born, but they had to go to L.A. where the hospital and the doctors were. That's why I was born in L.A., but actually, they lived in La Habra. That's where my you grandma know, lived. Home. When did they arrive? My father came in 1898. He never went back to Japan. Why did they come to California? Well, it's a long story. My father was in the diplomatic service, and he, uh, oh, he he went as a government resident when the Russian-Chinese war. He probably don't know history that much about it. I think they fought over Korea, went to Japan and China, I think. So. Uh, but from what I could remember, he was going on a world cruise. Those days, uh, different countries had ships that went around the world, and he was traveling. And he, uh, when he was in China, he contacted malaria. So when he came to San Francisco, he had a malaria attack. So he went to the hospital, and they couldn't wait for him, so the ship went on and left him here. Well, so meanwhile, what well, went in San Francisco, he uh, met friends there. And uh, uh, you know, work. They used to work like houseboys. You know, those days they didn't have me, uh, men did all that. You know, they do the cooking, and, and they uh, these wealthy people would uh, have teach him how to clean house and teach him all these Japanese you know people to do. So, uh, in fact, uh, you know, Grandpa, uh, my father, uh, knew his friend who was working for Mrs. Stanford, Stanford University. And uh, he had, uh, he died, but before he died, he started leading Stanford University because his only son passed away quite suddenly. Well, the story my father tells me is that, that uh, he had, he was in the gold Russian mining business at the time, railroad, you know, and they hired all these Chinese immigrants. They didn't hire them, they brought them over from China. So when he got through with them, a lot of them were killed in mine explosions, and my father heard the story that they did that on purpose. They didn't want to do with the Chinese immigrants. So uh, Leland Stafford's father, you know, felt guilty about the whole thing. So he started the Leland Stafford University. And there's a rumor my father had heard that like uh, Oriental students were be able to get that free tuition, especially the Chinese. And so one day I was reading some book and and uh, I read about that, that that was, you know, uh, somebody. And I should have kept that book, but I don't remember where I read it. Some places said, you know, so I guess it was true. That's the story my father told me. And then he had friends down here in L.A. area. So uh, uh, here before the earthquake, that was 1906, wasn't it, earthquake? Mm -hmm. He moved down just before the earthquake. Uh, and so uh, uh, he majored in English in Wasa University, so uh, he was able to get work. And so he worked for a bank. In those days, uh, the bank controlled all the property, you know, uh, farmland, you know, all over. You know, it used to be those olden days, you know, the bank always owned the property. So he, uh, uh, what he did, he went around and uh, uh, developed acres of land for citizens' industry. So that's why he was in La Habra. I think there are about 100 acres that 
we lived off and developed it for, you know, the, uh, for the you know, citrus industry. You know, I remember, I look out the window morning, there'd be coyotes running around, jackals running around. <laughs> you know, it was just out in the wilderness those days, you know. So uh, that's what, you know, my, so my father, uh, everybody thought he was a farmer, but he, wherever he went, he worked at, at the, you know, orange industry, you know, he said there's developing land. He went to Vista a long time ago, and I remember that too, uh, you know, big, Nothing's there. All you know, he developed for the farming of the citrus industry. So that's so whatever. Up the time he died, uh, he either managed uh, orange groves for some, you know, you know, American people that owned the property. So somewhere in this, did he meet your mother? Well, no, they were. Uh, they were already engaged in Japan. He was getting married. But he got back, but she didn't go back, so she came over here, and they were married here in San Francisco. When did she come over, do you know? I think she came in 19, I think about 96 or 7, I'm not quite sure. I have it written down on that, that's the information I get, I think nine. Well, you know, maybe before that, because the earthquake was 19, it was after that, because he had the, uh, go by train to San Francisco to meet her. So that was after the earthquake, so she must have been 1907, because I was born in nine, so I think it must have been 1907 she came here. So he went and got her, and did they come back down to Orange County? No, uh, we, well, at the time, yeah, they lived in the harbor, and then from there, and we, see, from there, we went to Whittier for a while, because he had an opportunity to manage uh, Orange Grove. And from Whittier, uh, let's see, from Whittier, we went to Glendora where he does another job, manage a big or hundred acre, something like that, orange, you know, farm, ranch. So I, I was about, I don't know, eight, ten years, maybe younger. Anyway, I, I was raised, I went all the grammar school to Glendora, and I went to graduate Citrus High School up in Glendora. Did your family own a property or did they rent? They always rented, you know, they were in, the, in his work they generally furnished a home. Mm -hmm. so, did you end up having more brothers and sisters? Well, the, well, actually, uh, there, were, see, there were four of us actually that lived together. We lost a, a, a sister during the influenza, you know, that, and then another sister. Two other sisters that were drowned in an accident. Oh. Uh -huh. So uh, there were actually four, four of us left. Can you tell me about your mother? Well, she was kind of pride one because she, uh, her she came from an aristocratic family, you know, so she took up nursing, but she never went to nursing, but she was a teacher. This, uh, where they called Masamoto Normal School, where they taught she was a teacher. She came and she raised kids. <laughs> she just had a lot of art though, huh? She did everything craft. That's where we get it, I guess, huh? Well, Grandpa too, in a way, huh? Mm -hmm. He did those birds. You heard about those carved birds that they made in post and they sold them to the fell place? I had, I have one. Oh, you took, you, you took that other one. Yeah. The, uh, you you know about it in Poston? Uh, this is the Blue Jay. Oh, and and, uh, was based on it. Someone started, and they took oh. wood uh, off of egg boxes that were sent into, shipped into Boston, mm -hmm. and it was a, it, it was a certain type of wood, it wasn't plain pine or whatever. So somebody uh, artistic started uh, copying birds from the National Geographic. You know, they have a lot of bird pictures in there, and they took a coven saw and then they cut it out and then they would sand and sand to get the shape, you know, and then some of them, uh, they look like ceramic, they did a real, you know, good job. So my father and mother did it as a hobby, and this, this is, you know, they weren't as good as some of them, but then my father did the carving and sanding, my mother did the painting, you know, and we sold, she, they sold a lot, you know, but uh, at one time, you remember L.A. in the books? 
in L.A. Mm -hmm. They were selling them there for twenty dollars. The, the ones that are very, very nice. You know, it was so well done. It was like porcelain. It was so pretty. I would buy one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know, I saw a lady one time shopping or something. I went up, asked her where did she get that. She said she bought it at Brooks in L.A. And it looked like a ceramic pin, and they had all kinds of, uh, uh, this is a blue jay, but uh, they had, what, red robins and hummingbirds and mm -hmm. every kind of bird. Wow. And, you know, they really are, I had that frame, I should have, I had a frame that I kept at one of the beach, uh, you, you, I think it's over at the house, isn't it? No, I have it. You took it home. Yeah. What do you remember most about growing up in California? Oh, I mean, <laughs> California, I was a horse. She had a horse. Oh, well, for, well, from high school, I went to SC. And then when I graduated, I worked for a, in LA at, at Rexall Drug for a while. And then I was offered a job managing a drugstore. And so I did that for West and East San Pedro. And I managed it for quite a while. And then my folks bought the place and I ran it for nine years until war broke out. And then we got, you know, in, had to leave to be turned. So we went to Boston, and then and, and my husband's family was from Anaheim, so they had an orange grove, so we were able to, the house was still there. They had all, you know, uh, boarded up, you know, so uh, the neighbors took care of the place. So so I've been in Anaheim since about 40, 40 45. The year war see, ended in '45, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So we came back to Anaheim in August. I think war in July or something. August was it after after Hiroshima? So we came after. Yeah. Anyway, end of August '45. Mm -hmm. did, did you ever tell her about the? You still have a newspaper club, Daddy, when they sued the Western Defense Command. You know, that, you know, they don't bring that out. You don't hear about it, do you? But the newspapers, it's true. See, there were 20, uh, they say, citizen group that were going to sue the Western Defense Command, uh, Commander DeWitt was head of the Western Defense, and they were going to sue for uh, uh, intern us without due process of law. So my husband, and there were several, and they all dropped out, and the East, uh, what's that, Union, you, you, ACLU. Yeah, they put out the money and they got the lawyers and took took them to court. And uh, finally, there were only three left. Uh, doc. There was a lawyer and a dentist from up north and Daddy. Huh? They sued the Western Defense Command. Well, he went. There's no laws that he could do anything about it, so he resigned. So and then another major came. It was the third one finally. And then, you know, they kept fighting back and forth. <laughs> you know, my husband told, said something, and the commander said, well, we should have had you guys on our side. Well, I said, what's well, our, our, <laughs> you know, why they were there. He says, you put, put a, you know. So anyway, they didn't issue any, they could decide what to do. They said, well, go back to your camp, and something will happen. We'll let you know. And that was in April or something, I think. And in July, after they started, they opened up the coast. Mm -hmm. You know, because they were afraid, because there's a, there's a due process of law. They couldn't, that was illegal. Now, you know, when Reagan, you never can do that now, because it's illegal to uh, deport people without due process of law. Mm -hmm. See, so, uh, you know, it's funny, nothing said about it that. So we had, he had his pub. First page at any time, the examiner, and uh, uh, we, we kept the papers. And I think Jerry made a slide of them, didn't he? She still has has the newspapers, front page at LA Times and ex examiner both. So huh? all the articles, you know, about the court trial. But but it never has come up, has it? Nobody paid any attention to it at the time. Cause that was forty. Cause he, so you were born in 47 and we 44. came 44. We came back when you were just about two well, a almost year old. two. Jerry was four. No, I was we I was less than a year. I yeah, you're a little baby, yeah. Jerry was two and you were just real small. Yeah. It, they were both born in Wow.
Well, I'm going to ask you some more questions about before you went to camp. Okay. Go ahead. Um, what are some of your earliest memories of attending school? I don't know. Well, I had a rough time, I know, because there was a lot of discrimination when I went to school. You know, and we were, uh, there were no other, you know, Moreros around those days in that area. I know, you know, uh, we never could join clubs, you know, they never asked us to join, you know. Orientals, I guess, and even SC. It shows what changes. You know, when we went, you know, we could join, you know, sororities or you know, for they were never invited, and so we had our own uh, organization. You know, Japanese. You know, uh, it was like a group. You know, uh, and so we used to have our so own, you know, socials that way. That's how it was. You know, we never. Uh, but if you. Uh, was real good. They kind of accepted you to the sick, oh, what is it, that uh, fraternity they have. But they, we never had any social, nothing, you know, SC when I was going. That was 1927, uh, I graduated in 1930. But now, my nephew went to SC. He became president of the Trojan Club, which is the highest men's organization of SC campus. That shows how much, huh? That's amazing. You, you, you know, you would never dream that here we couldn't, you know, and then not only that, uh, Ken Nagazawa, who was the uh, secretary of the Japanese consulate at the time, more broke out. And his wife, he taught Asian, uh, you know, uh, who's that? Betsy. Oh, oh. perfect timing. She's supposed to come out and join. What was I saying? <laughs> oh, we were talking about SC. I was going to ask you, um, you said you graduated there, you got a degree? Yeah, on well, pharmacy. Pharmacy degree. Okay. You were talking about the ambassador and his wife. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the secretary of the consulate taught Asian history or something, SC. And so uh, uh, his wife was our sort of sponsor in our group, you know. And so during the war, you know, they. I mean, during the time, my husband sued the West Defense Command. They looked up all our background, both of us. And one of the reasons, they considered me enemy alien because I was friend of the secretary, secretary's wife, because they were connected with the Japanese consul. I was an enemy alien. Even though you were? And then, and then my husband is 4F because he, he worked on a tuna, you know, fishing pole, and they, they were accused of, uh, trying to imp uh, provide oil for the Japanese warship. Wow. It's, and so after trial, my husband had the lawyer get all the copies from the other, and all that was in there. That's how we found out that they said I was in So here, my two brothers were in the service. My husband's brothers, two in the 442nd, and then family, brother and sister, one was any alien, while the others were in the service. That's just how stupid people are, doesn't it? It was really stupid. See, like us, what? Uh, Uncle Milton, uh, my brother in law, and, East, uh, and my other brother in law, and then who else is from my family? William. Was there were about nine of, of our family were in the service. But my mom and I were enemy aliens. You know, it's hard for you people to understand that, isn't it? It is. Yes. The people get so hysterical, they don't. Think, think through. Like, you know, I hate the Democrats because, well, you know, he's the one, you know, the 9066. That's why he, and he didn't have any right to do that, you know, because they said that it was illegal, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. But nobody paid attention to it at the time. Like you, you said, know. hysteria, huh? Uh-huh, just hysteria. And, oh, I know, <laughs> another thing, you know, James Roosevelt, the president's son, uh, he was against what his father did. So one day, I went to a wedding anniversary, and these people related to the, uh, uh, you know, the New York family. The Rockefellers? The Rockefeller. So uh, they, uh, they lived in New York, and uh, so these people had a reception in Beverly Hills, so my husband and I were invited to go, and James Roosevelt was there. He came, he lived in California, Newport Beach, from where I he, he didn't get along with us as a family, mm -hmm. you know. So he 
talked to us and he talked to Daddy that he said that his father made a big mistake and he was always against it. James Roosevelt told us that. You know, we met at uh, Debbie, you know, I think it's when Sam was at a wedding anniversary or something. And he was there because to the Duke, uh, the Rockefeller. Yeah, the father was related to the Rockefeller family one day. So, so, so they were friends. You know, mm -hmm. so all these happened, you know, and then, oh, it was terrible those days, but, you know, they did things without thinking. Illegal things happened. You know, they took everything away from us, you know, my drugstore. I didn't have time to pack everything, you know, so we just left it. Not only that, they kicked us out of there, gave us to move out. So they said uh, he could come back in the next day because the Army had come in with the guns and everything. They were, you know, running all over. So we went back the next morning, and I had left some of my good clothes and some of my things locked up. Somebody had broken in and stole everything. And my mother, Grandpa, had a collection of uh, Japanese dolls, and uh, they couldn't get them into the car in a truck, you know. So she, was, uh, my brother, was going back to pick it up. They woke up, woke in during the night, stole everything. You know, these people thought they had access to everything just because the war is how many thousands away from here, and they thought that, you know, they could just take over. You know, like at first, people trying to move, and they. Didn't could take their like pianos and your appliances. First they gave them good price. At the end they were offering twenty or twenty five dollars for a piano stove. So these people got real upset. They said they'd leave it rather than sell it. You know, what could they do with twenty five dollars? Mm -hmm. And and so after you know everybody moved out, somebody got hold of all those things. Hello? And people too I heard were they got word after the war, they took all the cash out of the bank and they buried it and, they, and some of them couldn't get it out of there. You know, those things, I know it happened, but you know, it doesn't, you don't hear about it unless you're involved in it, you know. Oh, it, it, you know, so, uh, like, you know, most of, so many niece says a Democrat, you know, and I said, my father was couldn't vote, but he was, Staunch Republican because when he grew up, Democrats really said Jap Japan. They discredited Japanese people. You know, when the days that we grew up, you know, Republicans are more conservative. So my father couldn't vote, but he, you know, he studied English, so he always was a Republican. So I'm still a Republican, you know, because I feel like, you know, <laughs> like that's why I said they put us in cap. Why do you want to be a Democrat? You know. <laughs> I can completely understand and, 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 that. And, you know, Bush, is, they're the ones that actually got things straightened out. Now they can't ever, can't ever happen again. Mm -hmm. One could be in turn like that anymore. And we got letters, and well, then we got a little money out of it. <laughs> yeah. I'll be asking you about that a little bit later. <laughs> Only $20,000. Now that $20,000 is nothing <laughs> to oh. what we lost, you know, really. We're being spending, what, almost four years in camp. That's what they paid us, $20,000. There's really no amount that they could have given that would have made up for it. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask you another question about before uh, internment. Um, can you tell me about your friends, any friends you had? Oh, yeah, I had a lot of friends. and uh, I went to church, so I had church friends. And in, in law, she, she was a friend from church, and she used to, uh, church friends, you know, kept, but this girl kept writing to me back and forth from camp, you know. And so at church, maybe Christian people said, they asked her why she wanted to keep in touch with me. You know? That's all, you know. I think that like now one thing. I think it's funny. Remember, uh, our neighbor uh, told us that her neighbor had threw out all the zoris, the Japan-made goods, all the trash in the front. So other neighbor went and picked them all up because <laughs> it's a made in Japan. You know, uh, uh, what was the name? Uh, Pete's wife, Peter's wife. She told me that. <laughs> you know, she was a neighbor of Sarita. She said, this lady has thrown out, you know, Zori because of Japan. And now Zori they have for evening word. <laughs> wow. And she said, in everything she had, dishes and everything made in Japan. This neighbor throwing it all out. So this other neighbor picked them all up. <laughs> she told me. She says, never, she was a close friend, you know. So she, she said, it doesn't make any difference to me. She picked them all up. <laughs> Did you have any friends that were different uh, ethnic backgrounds? 
people, not, not really, because those days, uh, when I grew up, there weren't very many, you know, little people, especially Japanese, there weren't very many. Right? I was always the only Japanese most of the time. Mm -hmm. But you, you had other people you associated with that In were... In church, you know, I had huh, a Caucasian friend that I still... But they're all gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think uh, all my friends have passed away. So when you were younger, when you were growing up, um, what kind of foods do you remember eating? Well, well, we, oh, my father wanted well, to be American, you know, so he would let us use chopsticks when we grew up. So I learned to use a fork before I used the chopsticks. <laughs> and, and, you know, he wanted us to be American, you know, uh, and then food. So we, you know, we didn't have, well, you couldn't get Japanese food. Because my mother cooked a member, you know, things, but you couldn't buy, you know, Japanese food. So we ate, you know, regular food. Like what kind, of, what would you have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Oh, just average, you know, cereal and eggs and whatever, <laughs> meat. And my mother uh, learned how to cook, you know, so uh, she kind of, uh, for to learn the English, she worked for families learning to cook. So there, she worked for nice ladies, they taught her how to cook, so. Oh. Do you remember like a, a special dish, dish that she knew how to make? Anything? No, I, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We, we, we didn't starve anyway. Uh huh. Like people ask us, this girl called from the Rough Shimpo, no, no, Pacific Citizen. She wanted to know how things were during the Depression. And I said, well, uh, everybody, you know, was having a rough time. She says, what did I says? I don't remember feeling that I was deprived of anything. Everybody was in the same boat, mm -hmm. you know. We, we ate, and I don't remember like people talk that don't know say depression, depression. But uh, like you know, we had enough clothes, and I don't remember starving or anything, you know. But they talk so much about it that uh, that I don't know what her name. She was some, but for love, she. Um, the Pacific Citizen called me, you know, the article was in the, did you see the article? Her picture was in it too. It's right there, isn't it? Well, she, the Pacific Citizen was there somewhere. So. We'll have to take a look at it in a little while. Yeah, yeah. You didn't see it, the Pacific Citizen. Well, you said you ate mostly American food then. Did you ever eat any Japanese food, do you recall, when you were growing up? I guess what my mother started trying to cook, I guess, stir fry. I mean, they call it stir fry now. Yeah. Okazu, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese okazu, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Did you have a favorite food that you liked? Oh, not really. Everything we ate, everything. <laughs> Did you ever eat outside of the home? Did you ever go into any restaurants or anything like that? They didn't have them those days. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I remember though when they had a grocery store, they sold ice cream cone. So my father always wanted us to go to church. Sunday school, so I think we had to walk a mile or two, so there was a little grocery store, so we were supposed to take our nickel, put an offering, so my brother and I stopped and bought a nickel ice cream cone. <laughs> 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 so we, we found our bottle, and we got school, so next Sunday we had to take two nickels to Sunday school. <laughs> I remember, oh, we just couldn't, had to have ice cream cone, it was a nickel, man, man, and we were just little kids. So we <laughs> ate our ice cream, spent the nickels on my father. We got we had to give two nickels in this. <laughs> Did you get in trouble for that? Yeah, we got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> um, when you lived in the home, still in your parents' home, what kind of things would you do? I don't know. What kind of activities? You had a horse, didn't you? Huh? Horse. Your horse? You had a horse? Oh yes, um, uh, when we left in La Harbor, I used to love horses. He got me a small horse, oh. and then uh, so I could get up on. So I had a rope with a box tied on it, so I could get on the box. And then I get on the horse, and then I pull up the rope and tie it on the. On the <laughs> <laughs> when I get down, I lower the box. You know, and I, yeah, I, I I always love horses. You know, and then my brother wasn't much that way, so we had a bigger horse, and so we went for a ride one day. He's two years younger, and he wasn't. I was a tomboy, I guess. Anyway, we got out and, and you know, they had uh, in the ranch, they used to go, you know, uh, for fertilizing, they grew uh, oh, alfalfa or something. So <laughs> my brother fell off the horse, he's in the grass, and he couldn't get up on the horse. So, so I thought, well, so I got off my horse and told my brother, get on my horse, because 
we had the so <laughs> then I crawl up on the big horse and I had to ride that big horse back on the way out on the right someplace. <laughs> wow. I still remember that my brother was a sissy at school. I had to go fight for him all the time. He get you know, he get teased and my father I said I, was, I remember I had to go <laughs> protect him. <laughs> he was a, you know see being a force I was two years older. So, you know, being a first son, you know, I think grandma spoiled him. You know, I was a toughie. <laughs> George used to be a sissy. <laughs> oh, wow. He probably grew out of it eventually, though. Yeah, I guess he did. <laughs> when he was a little, I guess my mother babied him so much being the first boy that wow. he was a sissy. And I was, I was grandpa's boy, I, uh, you know, girl. And I, he used to take me fishing, you know. And, and I don't remember my brother going along with me. I was always going along with my father fishing. <laughs> Um, in the home, what kind of responsibilities did your brother and, and your sisters and you have? Well, we, I know we had to wash dishes. <laughs> I didn't know. I don't remember what we did. We played around a lot. <laughs> did they make your brother do anything? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, in the home, what kind of responsibilities were considered the domain of the women? Or did it differ between the men and the women? Remember too much. <laughs> okay. What did your mom do around the house? Well, you know, she did everything cooking, you know, because she had to scrub, you know, those days, clothes that we, they had to boil hot water, you know, wash, you know. So I remember that clean house. What about your dad? What did he do? He just worked out, you know. So he worked outside of the home. home. Did he have any responsibilities inside of inside of the home? I don't. I don't. I think the men those they didn't do anything. <laughs> they worked outside. Did your, ha your parents have different expectations for your sisters and your brother? Well, my mother came from a doctor's family. My great grandfather, doctor, my grandfather, and my uncle. So uh, they wanted like my brother to go, but he turned out to be engineer. Hmm. And that, uh, but so uh, uh, that's the reason. Instead of nursing, I went into pharmacy because she wanted me to go in something. They're the ones that talk me, but I really want to go into interior decorating, mm -hmm. uh, decorating or uh, uh, designing because I was a good uh, sewer. So in high school, my sewing teacher was uh, at studied in Paris, so she uh, thought that. Uh, in fact, I made her clothes for her because she, she trained me separately from the class because I was above the average sewing class. So she tried to talk me into going into that, but then my, my folks didn't want me to. They wanted me to more med medical field. That's why I went into pharmacy. So even though you didn't pursue that, did you still do it as a hobby? Yeah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. I, I did, I've done everything under the sun, <laughs> and craft and whatever. I made wall hangings and plant hangers. What else did I do? I made that little, to show the little doll I made. <laughs> uh, I made uh, all kinds of things I made. I sold at craft shows. And I just love to do that. In fact, I came here and I did some nut cups and things for the people. You know, these women are very clever. Yeah. <laughs> so like Valentine, I made a little... You can teach them a thing or two, kind of, huh? You know, they get, so, but I don't do it anymore. But I did when I first came here, because my hands are getting real bad and arthritis. Well, when you were younger, you said your family attended a church. What kind of church was it? Do you remember the name of it? Well, my mother was a, 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 a Episcopal church. Okay. She went to mission school in Japan. She was a Christian before, so my father was uh, born and uh, raised as a you know Buddhist, but he never carried through. He didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know he went. He you know he never attended church. My mother was quite active in church. Whatever I mean, as she grew up and became in this area, then there's more you know uh, more Japanese and they had churches. So she was, went to church whenever she, she was quite. Uh, grandma went to that uh, West LA. Uh, Japanese church there, the last games ever lie. Um, the church that your family attended, where was that located? Uh, that was in West LA. West LA. Uh -huh. Did and your my, family and my in-laws were, uh, they were active in the Holiness, Holiness, Holiness Church, mm -hmm. Methodist. Yeah, both of them, and my in-laws were very active in the church. Did your family observe a day of rest? Day of rest? Well, yeah, they always said it was Sunday, they never worked. <laughs> Grandpa always wore a white shirt and tie, huh? <laughs> he was really uh, at dinner, huh? He never 
after it worked around, she came sit down. He always wore a white shirt, didn't he? He didn't have dirty pants on, but he always wore a clean white shirt to sit at the dinner table, you know. And then he always said prayer. One time, Grandma prayed. You remember? She prayed so long, these kids got restless and they start laughing. They crawled on the table. Remember one time? <laughs> Grandma prayed so long, and the kids, she prayed in Japanese and they couldn't understand her, so they start. <laughs> <laughs> you and she didn't want to eat on the table. <laughs> she really, she blessed everybody in the whole family. Uh, All of everybody. I huh? bet you could appreciate that now, though, yeah. huh? I mean, yeah. they just didn't appreciate Bless so and so, but you know, and she'd pray on and on. Uh, <laughs> you remember that time? So she went, because <laughs> she, she was saying in Japanese, and they couldn't understand the prayer. <laughs> Did you guys ever do any activities together as a family outside of the home? Take any trips, anything like oh, that? Oh, yeah, we, as kids, we traveled a lot, didn't we? Uh, our father, you know, not, you know, my, after I got married, we did a lot of traveling. But before that, of course, we had to work for a living, so we couldn't travel any place, you know, when I was growing up. But after I grew up, we did a lot of traveling. So you said your father developed farmland, but, mm -hmm. but he never actually owned a farm or anything like that? No, no, he worked for the bank, you know. Mm -hmm. So did he, did he go to an office or anything like that, or he just traveled around? No, he just reported, I think, you know, yeah, I think he reported to the bank, I think. Mm -hmm. did, did he I have, I don't quite remember all that, I remember he does what he did. Did he have customers or anything like that, or? No, the bank sent him out. I see. You know, they had this land and they tell him to go develop it and they sent him out. Did your family ever associate with any other Japanese people in the area? Well, there weren't any around. <laughs> in L.A. there were, but in Oscar, they were, you know, they weren't farmers those days, you know, later on, years later, you know, they, but those days, it, they weren't around at all. Did you ever travel to join in with any cultural, Japanese cultural activities, anything like that? No, not, not really. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a chance to because when I graduated, I went right to work, you know, so, uh, you know, Social life was. Kind of, I had to work to help the family after I graduated college. When you were younger, were you able to attend a language school? Oh, I had special tutoring when I was going to college to learn uh, to, you know, maybe. He was the principal of a Japanese school, so I had special tutoring. And, but I forgot it all, though. I can't hardly read anymore. Mm -hmm. I could talk okay, like I could go to Japan, I can get by on it, but I can't read or write anymore. I don't use it enough. You forget it. Um, when you were still living at home, did you uh, participate in any activities, any sports or theater, dance, any boys or girls clubs, anything like that? Well, after I got in college, you know, I had some, but, uh, you know, I had always had to work. I didn't have time to. Even when I go into college, I stayed with the family to get my room and board, and then I worked after school to, you know, uh, learn more about the farms. I worked at a, uh, a pharmacy after school, mm -hmm. you know, and got my free lunch that way. And I had to, I really had to work hard for college. Where the other kids, you know, they get through and they go home to study for the finals. I go home after work and just stay up to one or two o'clock studying, I remember. Because you know, they go home, you know, school's out one, you know, they go home study, but I could never do that. I had to, you know, I stayed to eat those. You know, I went upstairs and studied till, and the next morning they they heard me. They said, "You were up late, weren't you?" <laughs> they they would say that because they heard me going to the bathroom at oh. night. <laughs> uh, so I didn't have much of a social life as I grew up. I didn't have time. What about your parents? You mentioned your mom was involved in the church. Um, was she involved in any other activities outside of the home, or was your father involved in any activities? Well, my outside? father read a lot. He's he didn't get. Grandpa, huh? He's always reading. He, he said he read the Bible through twice or something. Oh, wow. You know, and he'd go to the library. And then one time, my son was such a rascal, Jerry. So he went to the library and got a book out to raise kids. <laughs> my son was the first grandchild in the family, and he was spoiled and such a rascal. So he, he went to the library and got, you know, uh, books on child raising children. He was reading that. <laughs> what I was doing wrong, I guess. <laughs> oh wow! 
<laughs> yeah, he was the library. But you, but I don't really remember that. You know, Pasadena, he walked out that he, he got books out of the library, and he got one out of the race. <laughs> Jerry was so naughty. One time, that, when he was about four or five years old, they had a fight. Oh, he went to bother him when Grandpa was trying to raise a little garden or something, and they had a fight. <laughs> Grandpa got mad because Jerry cussed at him. And then he talked to each other for a long time. <laughs> They're like kids. <laughs> he cussed at his grandfather? <laughs> I don't know what he said, but Grandpa got real mad. Wow. He would talk, talk. He was only about four, four or five years old. He heard somebody using oh, he probably, oh, or something. He probably didn't even he know what he was saying. He Grandpa, uh -huh. so Grandpa got real mad. Oh. Then he talked to each other for a long time. Oh, my goodness. And Grandpa would talk to him. <laughs> We're going to move on to your wartime experiences. Um, where were you when you first heard about the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Oh, I was in uh, East Sabbath, Turner Island. Well, in fact, that morning, December, that was on a Sunday, I was going to a shower for a... Uh, 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 oh, he became a, came out of manager of the service. Uh, ISO, John ISO, he was a judge. I don't know where you came from, but he graduated Occidental College and he was a... Uh, he became a judge finally. But uh, he was married to this distant relative of mine and they're having a shower out there. So December I got all dressed up but in those days we wore hats and gloves, you know. So I was going on to get on the street because those of you went by streetcar. So I was going and I got stopped because there, I guess the MPs were told to pick up any suspicious character. So they had guards all around this, you know how lumber yards are, there's a lot of space, so they're picking up Mexicans and Filipinos, and, and he made me go in, and here I had gloves on, all dressed up, and I had a coat with a fur on it, and, I was, and they told me to go in there, so I was real mad, you know, so funny, the MP was sent around with guns, you know, so funny the FBI came, and he came up to me, and he says, where are you born? They said, you don't belong here, get out of here, get out of here, and he let me out right away, you know. And they, they served me there with all those dirty people, and I was off in the corner, you know. I felt, you know, all, they picked up all this scum and they threw me in there with them. The MP, you know, they're so super, these, they're young fellows, they don't know. You were all dressed up and they thought you were yeah, suspicious. Yeah, oh, or something, maybe spy or something, they threw me in. <laughs> anyway, the minute the FBI came, he talked to me right away, because I was standing for it, you know. And he says, you don't belong here, get out of here. He says, go home. And so I never got to the shower. Oh. So my uh, relative, uh, she'd already had her gown and everything, but he had, he was a reserve, so he got called to the service. He became a, a major, finally, you know. Uh, John, it probably, you know, he had John Ice. He's quite a well-known judge. Um, when you heard about the news of the bom bombing of Pearl, per, excuse me, Pearl Harbor, um, what did you think? How did you react? Well, we didn't believe it. None of us did. And then, you know, to think that everybody was scared to death. And they thought that there would be enemy aliens going to do something, so they were all, that's why they were afraid that, why would we? You know, they were scared to death, you know, to get out alive, you know. And here it was just in the next, if not way, how many thousand miles away where the place of the war was, and they, you know, so I think to this day, they've never convicted anybody of espionage, have they? No, I don't think so. I think that one, something is not happened, but it's a Caucasian was involved. He, something, but I don't think they ever found anyone that uh, did any espionage, anything. I don't think they ever, you know, that's what they're afraid of. But do you think they would do that? Like, if they're afraid to death, because we lost everything, you know, and, and they really, like, uh, Japanese people are different, like the Mexican people, they're always faithful, they always send money and that, but uh, most Japanese people make, came here to make a living, you know, they didn't depend on the government, and, and they, you know, uh, like my father could wanted his citizenship, but it was at 57, I think, when they said that uh, Japanese it could be naturalized, right, 57. So by that time, my father, 80-some years old, he says, when he wanted, he couldn't have us. He said, I don't want it now. Because <laughs> he was retired. What can he do at 87 anyway? He doesn't need it. You know, he said, so, but my uh, father and mother-in-law uh, uh, took 
speak up there in our church citizenship. But my, my father said, he said, when I wanted I couldn't have it. So he said, you know, I mean, it was no use to him by that time. So he didn't uh, apply for it, didn't get his citizenship. Did you talk to your parents about the news about Pearl Harbor? Do you know what their reactions were? Well, of course, I, uh, you know, uh, I got married before that. So, you know, they were, they were living in, uh, uh, you see, they were living in, uh, uh, so we were living together, so you know it was just a shock, and we didn't know what's going to happen. And you know, then they went to Manzana because they moved. They were in the L.A. area. So we were in Orange County, so we had to go to the post. And, see, so uh, you know, we got separated. You know, but how did the war between the U.S. and Japan affect your everyday life? I don't know. <laughs> it was terrible because <laughs> yeah. you know. We were free to do anything. We were in camp. Oh, about camp. How did you feel when you were going to, when you found out you were going to have to be relocated? Oh, well, we, well, in a way, we thought maybe we'd be safer, mm -hmm. you know, because we didn't know what was happening around here. Because the armies, you know, they're all over the place, you know, army trucks with guns, you know, well, every place you went practically. How did you? Well, we, went, we went by train from Anaheim to. Arizona, and that morning, the First Presbyterian Church, you know, the First Presbyterian Church in Anaheim, where ladies came out 4 o'clock in the morning, served coffee, donuts, to the, you know, out there in the cold getting on the train. You know, the city of Anaheim, some of the people came out and criticized them. The ladies, you know, came out. Christian charity, and they're being yeah, criticized yeah, for Christian charity. Yeah, were criticized for helping out the Japanese. Um, how did you feel when you heard about the house house arrests and the searches? About the what? The ho I'm sorry, the house searches and the arrests. Did you know of anybody that had their house searched or were arrested? Oh, I guess a lot of them were, uh, you know, they, they searched, uh, especially those that belonged to, like, Japanese uh, uh, chamber, you know, they had, what, chamber of Com, you know, those organizations. They searched those people, like, I'm sure, and they picked them up. Mm -hmm. You know, they took them directly to a special camp. Where was it they took them? They took them to not Wyoming or they were taken to a special internment camp. Well, those people, you know, there was like a Japanese Department of Justice. Uh, uh, private, like uh, Japanese, you know, school teachers and people had to do with Japanese organizations. So like, uh, they picked them all up and they, they were, some of them, they picked them up and they never saw the family for a long time. You know, they just took them up as they were. You know, they couldn't even uh, say goodbye to the family. They just took them, put them in. What was it? Not Wyoming, but one of those. New Mexico. Some place. Uh huh. They, they took, but they, some of them finally graduated. Some of them came out, but some of them stayed all to the war. Huh? So. How would you characterize the relationship between Japanese and non Japanese Americans in California during the war? I don't know, because we didn't see, we, we, you know, we didn't, I, I, most of the people, I think, uh, you know, uh, wanted us to stay out of California, because they take over everything, farming and business and all, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think they wanted them to come back. And so you were married before you went into camp, correct? Mm -hmm. What year were you married? Or was I married? Uh, what year? Uh, not, let's see, 1940. 40. Yeah, 1940, 40, oh, yeah, because Jerry's born, yeah, 40, yeah, 41, 40. Can you describe your feelings when you first heard that you would be relocated? Well, it was bad. <laughs> we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know where we were going, you know. In fact, we didn't know because they had the shades pulled on the trains and they took us, switched here and there, got, got, and they got on a bus and they, at Parker, and they took us in here. It was, by that time, it was about late in the evening. It was just getting dark, and here we kept going and going, look for nice buildings, and the roads got dustier and dustier, and here, all of a sudden, we saw this, all these army barracks. They, they said there was a hospital there, and they had school buildings there. That's what they told us, but that was all set up after we got there. Was it just you and your husband? And, my, and uh, his family. His family. I with uh, my in law and my family. My brother, they were at Demanzano because they were in the L.A. area. How old were you when you went to camp? Oh, I was almost like 26. 
Um, what was the process of relocation like for you and your family? Process? <laughs> what was it like? It up. The relocation. Like, what did you have to go through to do it when you got there? What was it like? Oh, it was horrible. It was, it was just dust, and uh, we were dying of thirst, so they gave us water, and I spit out the first part. I felt like I was drinking mud, because the Colorado River, when we were there, it was brown, dirty. But, you know, since we were there, they brought the parker down, so now it's Lake Havasu, it's beautiful like a big lake. That was muddy water, and they were pumping that you know, into the camps. And so uh, somebody often offered me tea, and it was a little better, but I never forget that first, oh, swallow. I just felt like I was eating dirt. And that river, you know, it's unbelievable. We went to Lake Havasu, you know, uh, way later. Well, well, when, uh, well, when was it? Was with kids, because our son had a boat, and he used to go up there. And it's beautiful, that water is blue, and you never dream all that built up, and we were there. It was just brown water. You know, the, that's what the dam did. You know, cleaned it all out, and they used that water for drinking and everything. Now, but and then I portion is all gone, huh? But it's, it's all farmland, isn't it? All green. And there was nothing but mesquite there when we were there. I've never gone back. But, uh, she, he went, huh? They said uh, they have a highway. It goes from Parker, right near, right by there, huh? to, uh, what's that go, from Parker to, uh, to the reservation, uh -huh. post uh, Eagle, reservation. Can you see it from the roadside? What? Uh, that park, uh, I mean, the uh, Boston Monument. Yeah. She saw, uh, you know, her daddy's uh, bronze plaque there. I didn't know it was, it was there, but she saw it. <laughs> For some reason, they it says a bronze black picture. <laughs> she called and said, Daddy's picture's there! <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> she went to see it when she was in Phoenix, you know. Yeah. Um, when you were re relocated, what did you lose? Did you lose your home? Did you lose your business? Oh, uh, my folks, you know, had a ranch and there's a house there, so uh, they, they, we took what we could and, you know, they left it. But when he came back, we'd gone for so long, the rat, you know, Dropping all over the place, and oh, it was horrible. We had to work hard. At least we had a place to come to, to sleep. But a lot of people didn't have a place to go after they came back. In fact, well, I don't. Uh, there's a man in our block in Bolton. Uh, had a family. He didn't know what was going to happen. He had a place to go back to. And my husband flees, so he got caught. He hung himself because he said he didn't know. No place to go, no home, no money. You know. So you'd rather commit suicide yeah, than so, uh, face the unknown. Uh, my husband's called right away. He said he cut him down. He thought he felt the pause, I guess, when he cut him down the blow, blood flow. So he thought he was okay, but he was gone. It was so sad, you know. He, he had a family and he didn't know what to do. He didn't have any place to go. You were relocated to Poston. Were you in Camp 1, 2, or 3? Oh, well, number 1. See, that's the first one. And after we went there, the other two opened up. See, we were in the Camp 1. I think there were about 20,000 in Camp 1. I think 10,000 in the other two, I think. Yeah. See, we were the very first group that went in. So, uh, you know, Japanese people are ambitious. So everybody off, you know, they had army people cooking things for us, but uh, gradually, you know, our um, people took over because, you know, they're ambitious and they didn't have anything to do. So people cooked, did the cooking and uh, whatever they could do, they took, and then, so by the time camp was completed, well, it was all Japanese people doing everything, teaching. And some Caucasian people say I think like teaching and all, but uh, most of the work cooking and cleaning and all that, the Japanese people took over. What was your first impression of camp? It was horrible. Well, it, it, all these army barracks, and there was still sand all over. And there was a ditch, and I fell in the ditch. And, oh, wow. <laughs> and then, you know, I was pregnant, and uh, uh, you know, those showers just things sticking out on the wall. You know, you don't have any proper shower and toilet. It was just lined up and no partitions. So uh, our 
husband went out and picked up cardboard paper, you know, they think, so that at least they put a petition in between, but they're just lined up in, in, in a shower, just, you know, like the old-fashioned boy Jim, huh? they just have head sticking out, so being pregnant, you know, those kids, they look at me, I was so embarrassed, my first baby, so, so my husband's a priest, so I take a shower about 11 or 12 o'clock at night, and he'd stand at the door when we let everybody go back to <laughs> a private shower. Good husband. I was so embarrassed, you know, being pregnant with the first child and, you know, <laughs> people, kids would peek at me and I was so, felt so bad. So Somewhat said, humiliating, huh? Yeah, you know, so my husband said, I'll put a stop to that. So we waited until most of the people were, you know, everybody was through and then he'd stand by the door and I'd get a shower up on myself. Oh. Yeah, all those toilets, can you imagine? No, no. Nothing. So the, as the cardboard in between helped, you know, eventually they did, you know, well, think was nothing was ready. You know, and, and, and finally we got those army uh, mattresses. By the first night they had those, uh, uh, what do you call them, the, you know, uh, mattress that the guys had to like get bale of hay and fill them. Was it burlap? And they were so bumpy after a while it'd get in shape, you know, but oh, the first night was horrible. And then finally, the army got caught up, and they sent us the uh, like matches they used. The army, you know, the army. Uh, they didn't have enough, and they couldn't get it. Get enough, you know. You know, and then we had these sandstorms, and it's all dirt. We'd have to run inside, and you know, wrap. <laughs> you know, because the barracks, you know, the walls, the floor had the cracks in them like that, so they all comes in the house. Oh, I, I was scared to death. You and see, we reported the next barracks. Your roof's flying off, and they can't paint it. Oh, both of our roofs are flying off. I could see theirs flying off. <laughs> they pointed at us, and they said, your roof is flying off, too. <laughs> then it rained. Oh. <laughs> so you were with your husband's family also. Oh, uh, we were right, you know, we had the next uh, Did you have a whole to, barracks for yourself, or what? did you have the whole barrack for yourself? No, oh, just one, only 30 by 30, by 30 room. Mm -hmm. For each, you know, couple. So my, but they were next room, and we had one room. But she shared but one. it's funny they ran out of room. That three couples had to sleep in a room like that. Oh. No privacy. Yeah. A young couple they put them in because, they, but they let us have a whole room to ourselves. It was about this size, I guess. Uh, Linda Todd has joined us. She's uh, another daughter. <laughs> yes, yeah, she's my she's okay. my baby. Her baby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> Sixty-three-year-old baby. <laughs> <laughs> you look very young. You don't look sixty-three. <laughs> okay, um, we were discussing the daily life at the camp, and we'd already discussed housing. Um, what were the meals like? No oh, meals. When they couldn't get anything, we were eating spaghetti and rice. So my mother hated spaghetti. <laughs> and then one day, they couldn't get any food there, so they had. Uh, neck bones, you know, and then we had neck bones, boiled neck bones for days. At one time, somebody hijacked the uh, freight train to bring in uh, milk, so all the babe, so somebody, you know, because outside they were rationed, you know, those days, and they stole the milk train. So they were in milk for a long time, you know, I mean, until they got, you know, so food. But I know, I remember that, that spaghetti and rice. No vegetables. Well, finally, you know, uh, Japanese people are ambitious. They start raising, kind of cultivating, little, uh, raising their own food. So by the time we left, we had a poultry ranch and, you know, uh, a lot of uh, ongoing vegetables. You see, the thing was, the government wanted them to do that so that, you see, that was Indian reservation land, the government leased it. So they were supposed to return it. So they thought we would, the Japanese people, develop it and have them move in. But they're lazy. They moved several hundred people as the people left. But they don't want to. They want to leave in teepees and have everybody feed them. And so it never worked out. That's why they had tore everything down. They thought it was all mesquite. There, sand and mesquite. And uh, like the Japanese people got smart and they, you know, they, do you remember the mesquite? It's real hard wood. They could make different things. Uh, some of them made beautiful furniture. And then, and then somebody got smart, they found gems out there. So uh, they got the, I guess they got the government or the project okay, they're about to uh, 
you know, equipment in, and they made rings, and didn't you have a earring or something? Uh, you know, they made rings, earrings, and, uh -huh. you know, they were beautiful stones. Uh, did I give you earrings or something? Oh, uh, then they sold them, you know. So Japanese people were ambassadors. They just, you know, dug up, you know, they're like, they're throwing all this box and this wood that they made these birds out there, ends of egg cartons that they shipped in. Then they, somebody got smart, you know, and they were all busy doing something. You know, uh, like teaching, they had classes and like sewing and, you know, uh, to keep busy. But of course, I, I had my son, and two years later I had her, so I didn't. <laughs> so your two children, <laughs> not two, two, two of your children were yeah, born in Canada. I trying to raise my kids, and I didn't, you know, uh, do much of anything. What was that process like, uh, having children inside camp? Did they have a hospital well, there? Well, my son was one of the first born, but the first born baby there, they didn't have a hospital, so they had the barracks set up. And <laughs> I got acquainted with it anyway. Everybody was peeking in the window watching the delivery. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Can you imagine peeking the line up in the window watching the delivery? The first baby that was born there, see, they didn't have everything quite ready. So they just improvised one of the rooms. But then the hospital went up, so, uh, you know, everything, everything was. Well, four and a half years, you know, it was really. Uh, it's too bad, like. Somebody couldn't have moved in and, and you know made something of it because it was it, it was quite nice in you know, hospitals and schools. So it was something like a small in city. Schools, why their own people thought you know the teachers all took over from the, uh, the outside people that came to teach or whatever. They some of them, uh, most of the army was doing the cooking and all that, managing everything. But the you know the Nisei's all took over all that eventually. You said it was like a small independent, city. So it was independent. They had a canteen and they took care of them getting stuff in, you know, to sell and all. They took over everything finally at the end. Did they, the Japanese people have like their own kind of community police outside well, of the see, uh, They had volunteers like, um, I was a part, you know, they had these openings, so he volunteered for, and then he had about 30, well, I don't know how many policemen he had. They all volunteered. The, the fire, you know, uh, the fire ones and all that, they, uh, all volunteers, eventually they took over everything, ran was, the whole camp. Was there much of a need for police and fire departments? Was it that? It, oh yeah, plenty, you know. The, 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 and of course they always had the fence and the guards all over with guns, you know, at night. And, you know, <laughs> my husband said they tried to come in and find girls, you know, the, the army camp was just two miles away. They had a station there, they, and they were still there, you know, watching, I mean, they were the carbon was out there. <laughs> anyway, uh, then they started sneaking liquor, the army guys, you know, putting the trunks that come in at night to sell. So my husband got called and he had to catch the army guys and report them. Wow. You know, because, uh, you know, he couldn't have liquor, so some of them, you know, they'd play any kind of money, you know, they'd sneak in at night. You know, army, they think they could get away with these army fellows trying to make money. Mm -hmm. and, and, and things like that. Did you have a job there? No, I didn't work at all. You didn't work. What did you, uh, you or your husband, as a family, or with your in-laws, what did you do for recreation? And that thing. <laughs> I didn't do anything. <laughs> well, they had different things. What night they have? They had made little benches and they'd have uh, shows. Uh, you know, big up screen out in the wide open. You know, they set a little old wooden benches at the. You know, the men built and we'd have movies at night, but I never went to the movies. I think one time uh, Jerry got lost. <laughs> he, he, there's a canal there. They, oh, they had the whole police department looking for him. And all of a sudden he says, maybe he's at the show. So he got up on the speaker and he said, anybody seen Junior? They used to call him Junior. Somebody said, oh, here he is. And he had sneaked into the movie with some kid and he was eating candy or something. Somebody oh. said, <laughs> He was so mad. They had the whole police force looking for him. He was only about three years old, and he took off. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so he said, "So somebody, oh here he is, because they knew him. You know, the policeman's sons. So everybody knew who he was." And he said, "He said, what are you doing?" He said, "Oh hi, daddy." <laughs> and I was in the hospital with her. Oh so, my goodness! So my husband didn't tell me. Because it worried. And it's one of the nurses came and told me, I hear your son got lost. And I said, I got all upset. You know, I was in the hospital having her. And I got all upset. And then, and then finally, and 
you know, he came and told me that, you know, he took a shower and he told this man to watch him, and the kid got away. <laughs> oh, they thought he got drowned in a canal, they had to search the canal, and oh, they were all the neighbors and nobody, you know, here he was at the movie. <laughs> Did you attend uh, church when you were at the camp? I did once in a while. They started, you know, they had barracks and they had, you know, services. I've heard ministers, you know, finally. They had everything, you know, church. And that's why Emiko, you know, my Yoshimine. I think her father started at one of the churches there. Her father was a minister, so. Any other additional thoughts about camp that you'd like to share? I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of crazy things happening. <laughs> You can tell us. <laughs> I don't know. He tells a crazy story. A lot of, a lot of these stories people never heard because, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I was home so I hear all these stories and oh, they, I know uh, he'd have to raid poker parties. <laughs> oh, wow. Men would play poker. <laughs> <coughs> you were supposed to, but they'd sneak and please. <coughs> he could pipe down you lots of things, you know. Mm -hmm. One day, two girls got in the fight because one girl was uh, trying to break up her family. It, it was sister to the guy and some girl. So this girl, the two of them got in the fight and they were rolling in the dirt, pulling each other's hair and he had to pull them apart. <laughs> and one day this man said, he, somebody said that he was having problems so he wanted to see him and he said his wife beat him up and so he was hiding behind a cardboard box in the corner of the room. <laughs> Somebody said that there was a big day, you know, fight. You know, they get, you know, this other thing like that happened, you know, they get, the couples got mixed up, you know, their, you know, how they do when they get so enclosed and so much that they, you know, it, you know, it kind of get on each other's happens, nerves. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Some of them just had sheet between the, you know, their beds, you know. Mm -hmm. So after you were uh, released from camp, do you remember when that was, when you were released? The, uh, we came out in 45, must have been August, because yeah, you were, you know, real small, she doesn't remember. And you said you were there for four and a half years? No, yeah, three. No, four, three almost years? four. Three and a half. Three, uh, three years? Four years. Three. 42 to 45. Okay. Um, when you released, what did you do? Did you come back to California? Mm -hmm. We loaded up a few things we had in our barrack and we came back, you know, to our old home. At least we had a place to go to. How did your life change during the war? That changed? Mm -hmm. What changed? I don't know. <laughs> it, it was horrible for a while because there's a lot of discrimination. And, uh, and for a while, we had to stand in line to buy meat, you know, the markers like Alpha Beta. But fortunately, the manager of the Anaheim, on the Anaheim Alpha Beta went to school with my husband, so he was real nice. But we had to stand in line for meat, and I had to go. And so funny, my two brother-in-laws came back from the service. His sister was attending a, where did she go, temple? She came, gradually came home. So there were his folks, me with the two kids, and the boys came home, the both boys. So, and then it says, so I, mean, I was feeding, my husband and I were feeding them all. Oh, and so he go to work and I go to buy groceries every day because I'd have at least a loaf of, their loaf of bread, a dozen eggs. We could uh, we could keep all that. We just sent ice for Frenchy Dose that we didn't have, you know, those ice. So I had to go shopping every morning to buy food to feed them. So one day I thought, Nobody gave me any money except what my husband brought home. So I decided I'm not going to go shopping today. I, I was so upset that I had to do it. Nobody offered to go. So I didn't go. Well, we didn't have much to eat that night. <laughs> we had eggs or something. But nobody, you know. <laughs> I never forget that. I just got mad. I said, I'm not going shopping anymore. And the day that my, she was born, I went to shop with Grandpa. And I felt kind of bad, and I was pregnant. So I went by the doctor about 3 o'clock. He says, I think you better go to the hospital. So I was shopping that day for the family. So I don't know what they did when I was in the hospital, having her. They probably managed somehow. <laughs> managed huh? some way. <laughs> but 
but my poor husband worked so hard to feed the whole gang. And then we looked, you know, we wanted to move on because I had the two kids, but, you know, they wouldn't rent to, you know, New and Jean, you know, people then. And so uh, uh, they'd be a uh, newspaper where they wanted caretaker to offer a house. And I know we didn't tell the parents when we were looking for a house because we knew we had to get out of there. But, you know, they would, you know, they say the job was taken or something, you know. So finally, uh, he finally uh, started trucking oranges from Anaheim to uh, San Francisco to send overseas. He'd get up four in the morning, make a trip, and come back. You know, and so uh, he worked with this man that he went to school with. So he had this home that he had rented out, but he said they were, you know, yoga is Okies, and he said they were way behind the rent. So he evicted them and let us, you know, have the house. So we were lucky. Uh, uh, so you remember the house we lived in? It was, and uh, we lived there for nine years, and I was saving. Every time I had extra money out of saving account, I put in five dollars, ten dollars a month or something. It took us nine years to save five thousand dollars to buy a home. So we start looking. Of course, it's a couple pay we went. You know, we found out they would sell to New and Jean. You know, uh, so uh, finally uh, we went. You know, place we bought. We went there, and the salesman was really nice. And so I said, "You think we could buy this house?" And he looked at me kind of funny. So we told him, "Well, you know, we were turned down." He says, "Well, I didn't know anybody." So he went back to the office. This is the cause in there: no Mexicans or Japanese or Yellows. And so, so he told him. So they decided that was wrong. So they crossed it out. So he came back. And he says, "Well, I inquired your neighborhood, and and you know." Uh, like hey, he was a service. He said, he said, well, he said, he said, hell no, who cares? He says, I like Japanese better than some other. He didn't object. And the next neighbor was, was the Gulliches, and he, my husband happened to know them from school. And this, well, anyway, these people more or less knew, so they sold us the house. We had a fight, and we were going to take it to court. But they, you know, they knew that wasn't right. That was in the clause that sold uh, the. Uh, I think it was, a, it was one of the big, one of the big, you know, realty companies. They had the clause in there. Mm -hmm. We had to fight for it. But then the neighbors were real nice, and we didn't have any problem. But uh, like colleges, and you know, the neighbor father developed the area, so he didn't care. And so you know, we finally. But then you know, they just kind of uh, wasn't too good about even letting us look at houses. Mm -hmm. Anyone, any, you know. We, we, you know, we broke the ice and, and, you know, another couple, Japanese move, a couple moved down the street. And, you know, we didn't have any problem. They're all very nice to us. You know, it was kind of rough. But then uh, my husband grew up in that arm, so he gradually, you know, got back in with them. So, you know, we got settled down and they were all good to us, you know, after we got going. What are your memories about the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Oh, I know that was really something hard because, well, we knew a lot of people, you know, in that area, so they had to do something, I guess. <laughs> but we went back to Hiroshima. We traveled all over Japan and, uh, let's see, when year was it? We went there and it's all cleaned up. You never know. They've got a monument. Like uh, when we went to Europe, you know, where they bombed, it's still, you know, we saw spots where it's still the way they bombed it. but. In Japan, they cleaned the whole thing up. There was no sign, and that whole place is bombed up. You know, they had a monument there. You know, uh, Shinsho, my cousin, took us there. We had a tour of Hiroshima, and you never know. I, I thought maybe, you know, you see somebody, but there's nothing. It's all cleaned up. That shows ambitious people, ambitious, you know, they, they want to keep the memory. You know, forget about it. So they just the monument is all it's there. It's all cleaned up. It's amazing. You know, when there's nothing there, it's all cleaned up. You never would know. What was your response when you heard that the news, um, excuse me, when you heard that the war was over? Oh, well, we were in camp, of course, you know, we were all excited. <laughs> then they said we could leave, you know. But the sad part of it, so many of them didn't know what to do. They had no place to go. And some of them had saved money, but some of them, you know, didn't have money. Like, we were fortunate because, uh, we had orange growth, so uh, you know, you know how packing now pick your oranges, and you don't pick your oranges, and so they had accumulated the uh, income from the oranges and had uh, 
save that force that took them out in Boston. So we had, you know, we were able to deal with it, and we had a product every year picking while you get checked from the packing house. So we, you know, we didn't starve. Mm-hmm. My husband worked for it. So finally, he, he went commercial fishing for a while because that was a lucrative job at the time. And then uh, he was looking for an engineer job, and that's what he wanted to do. So uh, our neighbor, his uh, brother was a, he was a manager of the Fuller Corporation, I mean, uh, the construction, so he started working there. He started out with working on, on the field, so he got mad, and so the this man came out and said, what's the matter? And he says, I'm not going to work out here in the dirt. So they gradually worked him up, so he ended up having a, engineering job. He worked for the for a company, traveled all over the United States. That's how he found, we finally got started living normally. Yeah. <laughs> then he, from there he went to work for Aerojet, you know, jet propulsion. Mm-hmm. And then he, when they finished the job, I didn't know that, but you know, they did the second phase of the first uh, flight to the moon. Some part they did, and he didn't, you know, it was secret, so he didn't tell us until he died. One well, of the fellows he worked with told me about it, you know, uh, the, what's his name? Uh, uh, you know, the arm, he wrote to me, he said, they're the ones that knew about it, but because he kept saying, I said, you want to get to the moon, because we didn't think it happened, but he kept saying, oh, they're going to make it, they're going to make it. So, see, he knew that, you know, for a good chance, you know, and I didn't know that until after he died, wow. that they had worked, you know, on that project, you know, that Norris told me, he says, uh, you know, you know, that's so, <laughs> and then another interesting, we meet more, being old, you, you know, about ice skating, I remember they talk about the Zamboni machine, mm-hmm. well, I know the Zamboni, <laughs> but uh, we're in Vista, I went to school with his wife, and they came to Heinz, you know, Heinz, it's called, like, it's, uh, what is it now, it's not Heinz anymore, but, you know. Anyway, he uh, started, uh, open, you, you remember, I took, we took you out there, the ice was just on the ground, he had just the board fence around, and the kids skied there. Anyway, he started making that ice, for some reason, and he started with a ro- uh, lawnmower to make that Zamboni machine. Wow. And, and uh, so I tell her, I know the Zamboni, some parts of that just the name, but it's their name, Zamboni, their family name. I think the third generation son runs it now. Uh, and, and it's all over the world. They're telling me how many machines they sold in Japan and Europe. They even have a song all about the, the Zamboni, world, too. And, you know, and I tell her, I know the Zamboni. <laughs> I told somebody that, you know, they said, you do. They thought that was just the name he put on, but that's the family name, Zamboni. Said, and uh, there's an article in time, he, the old Zamboni died not too long ago. Mm-hmm. I think a couple of years ago, there's an article in the time that showed how he started with the, uh, the law mortar. And then when uh, Sanja Henny, remember her, the skater? Sanja Henny, the famous skater? Mm-hmm. Probably be for you. Anyway, when she used to skate, why uh, Zamboni would go along with her to prepare the uh, ice for skating. That's really yeah, interesting. That, you know, so that, you know, I didn't think any of it, you know, and then when Bristol, you know, I went to school with her, so we, when we got married, we exchanged wedding gifts, and, you know. <laughs> wow. Um, what did your wartime experiences teach you about being a Japanese-American? Well, <laughs> I don't know just what to say about that. Were you ever uh, politically or uh, involved in the civic participation? Oh, I worked well. I got for the election board, you know. I think I did about three times in our every, you know, the election. Were you able to speak about your experiences, or did it yeah. take you a while to speak yeah, about people it? People asked me to. I spoke to church one time not too long ago, but, you know, most of those people are in their 60s and 70s, they don't know anything about it. Because, see, they were, you know, little kids. And they lived right around here, and some of them never heard about it, so they wanted me to talk again, but I said, I didn't want to do it. You know, Betty, you know, they asked me to talk about it again, and 
they told me, I, got, I didn't, I said, I got more material that you had, but I didn't have time, so I kind of made up a story. <laughs> You know, but they're all asking me questions, you know, and I'm so surprised, you know, that they didn't know hardly anything about it, the ladies at church. And my son uh, started uh, giving lectures. She has the materials that he used. Uh, he taught high school, and uh, his friend was a history teacher, and they don't have much in history books. So uh, he asked my son to talk about them. Huh? So he made slides, and he... Uh, gave, uh, uh, I think he, he spoke to some evening group someplace some one time about the, inter, you know, showed the slides of the picture, the newspaper that she has, showed it on the slide. Did you ever associate with any Japanese Americans that were not interned? Well, yeah, because my family, uh, you know, my brother and sister were in Chicago and, and uh, you know, they all left. Uh, my husband's family, you know, see his brother, let's see, who was out there? Chicago, my brother and sister were there, and then, oh, he was there, huh? But he went funny to Camp Savage to do the interpreting, huh? And my brother was at Air Force here, Air Force Base even, and I'm an enemy alien. <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> Did you, was there ever any resentment between the non-interned and the interned Japanese that you know of? Any, um, any resentment or animosity? Well, I don't think so. Huh? Uh, they, they took it pretty well. You don't say shikata nai, huh? Yeah, what can you do, okay? <laughs> That's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. You have to make the best of it. Yeah. And I think, you know, the only people were willing to struggle and get back. But some other people probably never say may not. Have done that. Mm -hmm. You know, they're willing to make a living and start over. Yeah, don't you think so? Yes. Like your parents, everybody started working and try to make the best of it.